Hello, welcome to The Biblical Perspective, an in-depth expositional study in the Word of God. Welcome to another presentation of the Biblical Perspective Bible Study. I'm Kevin Dunnigan, and joining me for our discussion tonight is my wife, but better known as Teacher Yvonne Dunnigan. Welcome, Teacher Yvonne. Thank you. Well, tonight we're going to jump right into it. Um, as we continue our study through the book of Philippians, we have come to a place where the writer, the Apostle Paul, is giving instruction on what indicates that someone is a true believer in Jesus Christ. During the time of the early church, just as is the case now, there were people who misunderstood what it meant to be saved through the new birth and become truly righteous. Confessing Christ with words but not having the heart changed does not bring salvation. I have a little comment on that. This is crucial, crucial mm -hmm. to understand that spiritual growth can't be realized while you are living the same carnal lifestyle before your new birth. The new birth, as Christ meant it, is spiritual transformation. You should not be the same person as you were before. There should be a difference. So joining a church and attending regularly without joining Christ in the heart yes. does not produce salvation. And living a moral and ethical life is self-righteousness and does not save anyone. The scribes and the Pharisees did this and, and they did not accept Christ or his, his teachings. You see, knowledge of the content of scriptures and believing in their truth is mental assent, but does not produce salvation without obedience, actionable obedience to that truth. Preaching and teaching the gospel is not proof of salvation. Without obedience to the word being taught, Judas Iscariot, the disciple who betrayed Christ, he also taught and preached the word, but he was not saved. Um, people today get, and this is just my opinion, uh, people today get hoodwinked because they are moved and entertained by performance and presentation in the pulpit. Without sound doctrine and foundational biblical truth, those people are bamboozled straight to hell. Well, in our lesson tonight, the Apostle Paul gives the church at Philippi five marks of a true believer that should make, that we should make sure are evident in our lives. So we're going to read the passage and then we're going to move into the presentation. Okay. So our passage tonight is Philippians 3, 1 through 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, Paul says, and it is a safeguard for you. Be aware of the dogs. Be aware of evil workers. Be aware of false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. I mean, you read, read that with such conviction. You mind continuing on with the first verse? <laughs> <laughs> so here we find the true believer. Remember, we talked about five marks, so take good note. A true believer receives, rejoices in the Lord. Verse 1a. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. The Apostle Paul tells the believer at Philippi to rejoice in the Lord which means to experience joy that exists in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a relationship that never changes and will never end. Wait, wait, you mean that it, it's constant throughout? There's consistency? There's no highs, no lows, no ups, no downs? It's a relationship that never changes. Okay. And that's a wonderful feeling <laughs> yeah. because we change all the time. But God never changes, and he never ends a relationship or breaks a relationship. The, this joy is not the same as happiness. 
which is a word related to happenstance. Mm. And it is the feeling of exhilaration that is based on positive circumstances. The joy of which the apostle speaks persists even when the believer is, experiences disappointment, pain, and loss. So the outside circumstances don't affect the inner joy, the inner peace. The inner peace that God gives. It's a joy that's always there regardless of what we go to, okay. what go through. Well, to piggyback on what Ivana was saying, um, this spiritual joy is also called biblical joy mm -hmm. based on our trust in God. Now, we believe that he has a purpose for all that he allows in our lives. And with this, his power, he will work this out for our good. This gives us the ability to have joy instead of fear. So the key word in what I just said was not so much the, the joy aspect of it, but the trust. We have to learn, develop, and grow our trust in God. Mm -hmm. And that is how we're able to experience that spiritual joy in spite of the circumstance. In James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, it, he writes, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Um, it, it, when I read this earlier today, it took me back to, uh, we, we used to have a Rottweiler and her name was Sugar, <laughs> but we called her Sugar. And when Sugar was a puppy, any type of, of aggressive play, she would just jump all over again and, and just be ready to, to playfully attack. Mm -hmm. But after doing it so many times, she learned, okay, this dude's just joking around. <laughs> so by the time she got to be about, I'd say three or four, I would like do little motions at her and she would just look at me. It was like, okay, you know, I'm not gonna fall for this. <laughs> I, I, I know you're not serious. And I use that as an example that when we first become Christians, Satan throws all kinds of stuff at us and we squirm, cry, act, you know, yeah. we act out of character. But as we go through these trials, as we learn from these trials, and that's another key word, learn from these trials, it grows our sense of perseverance and endurance. So that when you get to a certain age, in spiritually, right. and you see something coming from the devil, you're just like, uh, try, try, try something else. You know, God's got this. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, it, and, it could, and from the, looking from the outside in, somebody might be saying, Kevin, Yvonne, are you guys gonna be okay? We're fine, yeah. God's got this. Yeah. Well, do you want, what do you want us, us to do? pray. We're trusting in God. That's that sense of confidence, that sense of trust, that sense of endurance that is developed when you're going through these trials. And oh, I oh, no. Can I add something to sure. that? And two, it's no, notice that you're not doing this on your own. Right. And that's what I like about it. It's just like relationships. Mm -hmm. In those relationships, you grow, you spend time together, and you develop a, a positive relationship and that's the same thing with with God if God is putting something into your hands or he's allowing a certain situation in your hand you're spending time talking to God about that situation it's not oh God why are you doing this it's like Lord you put this in my hand I know that you trust me to handle this situation but I'm not in it alone. Right, guide And you. I can come to you, I can talk to you. Right. I can fellowship with you about this. And, and you know what's amazing about that? Um, you remember when, when my previous employer was trying to give me a hard time, and it got to the point of frustration where there was nothing physically that I could do. And so after everybody else had gone to school and gone to work, I just sat on the couch and said, okay, Lord, I need you to show up. Mm -hmm. I know you're there, but and it, was, it wasn't like, you know, uh, I, it wasn't a pious type prayer. It was right. just like, okay, okay, dad, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to learn, but I just need you to show up. I need you to give me a little encouragement. And I kid you not, within 12 hours, I had booked a gig that was paying five <laughs> figures a week. And it was like, yeah, <laughs> but, and, and, and those, those situations mm -hmm. build your trust. They, they build your yeah. sense of, of, of confidence and they build the, in, in the relationship because it was just like, you know, I was sitting on that couch talking to you. You know, but I was talking to God, and it was and it was a sincere, you know, it wasn't like I said holier than thou. It was a sincere. Hey, I I, just, I need some encouragement yeah. right now. I, I need I need you to to reassure me that you're there. Right. And, uh, and lo and behold, <laughs> Amen. 
Um, continuing on with Romans on the same point, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, And we know, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, like followers of, followers of Christ, and I'm challenging those that are out there that are listening to this, as followers of Christ, we've heard this and we believe this, but do we live like this? Mm. That's what you, where you have to look in the mirror and challenge yourself. You know, it's, it's easy to say something, but the, you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding is when you live, live like it, when you live it. True believers have spiritual discernment, which is found in verses 1b through 2. To write the same things again is no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Next, the church is reminded of an admonition that Paul had given to them earlier, probably in Philippians 1, 27 and 28. It was regarding those who would oppose them and oppose the true message of Christ, mm -hmm. and that, of the Christ that he had taught them. Now, he refers to these false teachers as dogs, which was a derogatory term used, sometimes used by the Jews to refer to Gentiles. Yeah. But it was also used in the context of a pack of wild and diseased dogs that roamed the countryside, living as scavengers and plaguing ancient cities. The apostle is telling them to be on guard against mm -hmm. false teachers, who he says are evil workers. Yes, and this is likely a reference to a group of converted Jews mm. uh, called the Judaizers, which was uh, referred to as unclean teachers, who would attempt to bring works, righteousness, such as circumcision, back into the church. Mm. They taught that one must keep the Old Testament law in order to be saved. This false doctrine had infiltrated the Galatians assembly and was condemned by Paul in his letter to the church. And I wanted to emphasize a little something because we, we still do this today. Yeah. yeah, We try to replace the gospel of grace with a false or self-righteous doctrine. And that did not come from Jesus. No. Matter of fact, it was totally opposite of what he came. He came to replace that with the gospel of grace, which is completely different from works righteousness. Yeah. And another thing, uh, we must be aware of something here, of any system of theology that says we can earn our standing <laughs> with God. Uh, we cannot work our way into heaven. It is by grace and what Christ did for us. Amen. But we'll go a little deeper at later in this lesson. Yeah, it amazes me how, you know, people take, you know, you look at uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world mm -hmm. that he gave. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, for God so loved the world that you've got to work to get this gift. Exactly. He says he gave yeah. this, this gift of salvation. He gave his son. And, you know, it's like if I give you a gift, I don't expect you to have worked for it. Yeah. It's a gift yeah. from my heart. You know, I don't tell you, okay, hey, Yvonne, if you uh, mow the lawn 12 times this year, I'll get you a gift. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not a gift. <laughs> you that's, work for that's that. That's called a transaction. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And in Galatians 5, 6 through 8, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything no. but faith working through love. You were running well. What hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him, nope. Christ, who calls you. These teachers tried to combine works and faith as the way to get right and stay right with God. Just like the dangerous and diseased wild dogs, these false teachers would ra ravage and contaminate the congregation. This false doctrine would undermine the teachings of Paul and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which says that salvation is by grace, grace through, through faith, faith alone. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us, for by grace 
you will have been saved through faith and it is not of ourselves nothing that we could do no. it's a gift of god not as a result of work so that no one may boast i just have a little comment no, right no, there no, no. just a little one that i it's sort of like you would be saying that i did this or that mm -hmm. that i did my bible reading church attending praying giving so that makes me right with God. You know, we think in our mind that we're right with God. That's religion. Yeah. That's just, that's something that just weighs us down, that Christ came to change. You want to know something about that? It, the thing I, I hear and see about that is when is enough enough? That's right. Like this, you never know. You keep going on. There is no such end. Right. To anything like that. Right. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> well, then and now, the church must be aware of any theological teaching that says we must earn our righteousness by what we do. It's easy to, it, well, it's easy for well-intentioned spiritual leaders mm -hmm. to move into this area of legalism. This sometimes causes them to add works to Christianity, responsi Christian responsibility, in order to be saved. It must be remembered that salvation will produce good works, but good works will not produce salvation. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again for the people in the back <laughs> of the room with the camera. It must be remembered that salvation will produce good works, but good works will not produce mm -hmm. salvation. In verse 3a, it says, For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God. Now, to worship in the Spirit of God is to offer him praise and adoration out of our hearts, that are full, that's full of appreciation and out of the knowledge of who he is, out of the knowledge of who he is. Mm -hmm. From the word of God, we gain our knowledge of who God is and realizing what he has done for us, considering the blessings he continuously bestows on us. Mm -hmm. This causes our hearts to overflow with worship. worship. And a, an example of this is found in Psalms 29, 2. Ascri ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Mm -hmm. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Also in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Now, when I, with that last mm -hmm. reverence and awe, yes. it took me back to my bodyguard years. Okay. And I would work with certain entertainers, and people would would revere them with honor and awe yeah. and it was it it amazed me how to to be you know standing behind the, the, the celebrity and looking in these people's faces and I remember you know and I forgot about this but I remember a couple of times I had a conversation with the celebrity because one of them was was saved and I said I wonder if they look to God with that same sense of reverence and awe I wonder if they look to our our savior with that same se sense of reverence and awe yeah. I mean it, it's like that, you know, these people could walk into a room and, and wave their hand and the entire room would sway to the right, mm. sway to the left. <laughs> but you get them in church and they just sit there looking at their watch waiting for it to be over. Oh, wow. you know, yeah. uh, Did I say that out loud? Yes, you did. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the Holy Spirit within believers remind us that we are to worship God. Yes. As it was said before, how that's done. Then he aids us in our worship of God. Both the scriptures and the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are to worship God from our heart, with our words, and with our service, and with our lifestyle. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable for God, which is your reasonable or spiritual worship. True believers, we're going to talk about this, yes. should boast about the word of God and Jesus. We, make, we should make a big deal about the word of God and who Jesus is. And John 4, 23 through 24, it says, But an hour is coming, and now is, 
when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Can I take along on that? Yes. Um, understand, with these words, Jesus described the basis for true worship. It's not found in places, places or, or trappings. And if you don't know what trappings are, those, those, trappings are, those are articles of apparel or dress that are ornamental in, in, in its presentation. Um, not singling out any religion, but just using you know, the apparel that the Pope may wear. You know. um, so it's, it's not found in, in places or trappings, it's, but in spirit and in truth. And to worship in spirit means you are concerned with spiritual realities, not so much with places and outward sacrifices or you know, cleansings or, or fastings or trappings, or as I mentioned before, as far as you know, what a person or, or a person's may have on. Um, it means to worship, in, and to worship in truth, it means you worship according to the whole counsel of God's word, especially in light of the New Testament re revelation. Mm. It also means that you come to God in truth, not in pretense or mere display of spirituality. And there are some churches that use varying church and Bible topics uh, without pointing any fingers, like speaking in tongues as a display of worshiping in spirit and truth. Mm. Where, yeah. you know, at, at our uh, institution here and through Bible studies, we've taught how that there's an error in that, that, that it's not all factual according to what is perceived by right. some, some church leaders. Right. So without getting myself into any more trouble, let me continue on. <laughs> um, in verse 3b, it, it, it says, and glory in Jesus Christ. The Greek word for glory in this, in this verse means to boast. True believers are to give Christ the credit for all that they are and for all that they have done. It is he who came to the earth to seek and to save the lost. He sought us with his words with, and with his actions. He taught us. An example of that is in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, where it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save which was lost. We should follow the example set by the Apostle Paul and, as I was saying earlier, brag about what God has accomplished in us through Jesus Christ. Yeah. God's love for mankind caused him to give us mercy and show us his grace. Jesus Christ is the grace gift that God gave the world, and he is salvation to everyone who places their faith in him. And 1 Corinthians 15.10, it brings joy to my heart, <laughs> but by the grace of God am I or I am, and his grace towards me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Can I, can I piggyback on that for a second? Yes. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, mm -hmm. not by the things I've done mm -hmm. in the church, yes. not by the amount of money I've given, to, God, to, to, to God's church, it's by the grace of God, I am what I am. Nothing else. And that's a true statement. Yes. Because it, could, it couldn't be done without Jesus. Could not be done. I'm sorry for interrupting you. That's Continue. okay. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> and Romans 15, 17 says, Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reasons for boasting in things pertaining to God. I'm going to try not to piggyback on that, <laughs> but I can't help myself. Okay. Again, getting back to what we talked about earlier in the, in the lesson, the knowledge of God, knowing who God is, studying your scripture, knowing the significance of Christ's actions on Calvary, that's, that, that is the reason for boasting. Once, once you, if you don't know that, then you're, you know, you're going you're gonna to lose a lot of joy. You're going to lose a lot of opportunities yeah. to boast. Yeah. And I love, I mean, that is the reasons for our joy. And Pastor Fred has 
gone and studied and written 13. We're in number 13, mm -hmm. talking parts of talking about joy. And if you don't find joy in this, I don't know where you're going to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so please, please study these five parts yes. of the true believer. Continue on in the uh, third part of or the C part of, of verse 3. It says, and to put no confidence mm -hmm. in the flesh. The flesh is fallen, mm -hmm. unredeemed hum humanness of man. It is natural, it is natural human ability and the natural human propensity without the influence of God. Mm -hmm. Those without God believe in, uh, those without God believe in and boast in themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I made this million dollars or I have, uh, you know, I, I, I bought five cars. Or yeah, you know, I, I gave to, you know, this foundation or I gave to that yeah. charity. Mm -hmm. That means nothing in the eyes of God. That has nothing to do with your, your, your sanctification, with your holiness, or with your Christianity. Mm -hmm. It should be an outward act of what's in your heart, not your, your self-righteousness in your heart. Um, they bo it boasts in themselves in thinking that they are adequate, adequate without God. And that is called fool's paradise. Yeah. <laughs> a good example of this is in the Bible is the parable of the rich fool given by Christ recorded in Luke chapter 12 verse 16 through 21 he had experienced an abundant harvest and planned to live in luxury for the rest of his life uh, sounds like one of those California lotto winners right? <laughs> and he didn't consider that he needed God so his plans were based on the flesh yeah. God required his life and he died leaving all those riches for others to enjoy and or squander. That's right. <laughs> in, chapter, in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, it says, For they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And the, the Greek translation of that word fools is, or that phrase, because it's actually a phrase that was translated in English, they became fools, is from the, the, the word moro, moros, which kind of sounds like moron. <laughs> a moron. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, the definition of that is to, be, is to become insipid, mm -hmm. which means trite, bland, stupid, weak, mm -hmm. and figuratively to make a simpleton. And I didn't look up the definition of simpleton only because I remember my grandmother would tell me, you know, growing up, don't be a simpleton. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, if I did something simple or, or, or out of character or dumb, she's like, Kevin, don't be a simpleton, don't do that. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, okay, I just did something that falls under the category of simpleton and I'm not going to be that. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, grandma. What about true believers? Grandma's always right. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> True believers, righteous grandma. There you go. <laughs> True believers do not place their any faith in their flesh. Yes. Because they have come to understand. That's the point. Come to understand that it is corrupt and rebellious. The Apostle Paul, one of the most spiritual people in the scriptures, stated that he realized that his flesh possess nothing good. And in Romans 7, 18 says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the w willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. Well, I, I had underlined where it says, where Pastor Fred wrote, they have come to understand. There's two <laughs> ways that you come to understand. Mm -hmm through studying scripture, learning it, and applying it, right. or doing the opposite of scripture and get taught a lesson. Yes. And sometimes it's easier to learn a lesson and apply it than to be taught a lesson because you may get a bad attitude about it and it's like, okay, I gotta learn this again. Mm -hmm. let's, let's put them through, put them through the ringer again until you get it because you, know, you have to come to understand what it is to be corrupt and rebellious. 
but you want to take the, the learning road, <laughs> exactly. not, not, not the taught road. I agree, and I've been taught some of those lessons myself. So you, you preach it to the choir. I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be, I want to learn it. I want to learn it. Uh, and that's why we're here trying to teach. Yes. <laughs> uh, the flesh of man cannot be trusted, and it should not be followed. Believers are to walk, which means to live, by the Spirit, and not give in to the sinfulness desires of the flesh. We are, led to, we are to be led by the Holy Spirit and always endeavor to keep in step with him. Endeavor. Nobody's perfect, but you endeavor to keep in step with him. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, it says, So, so I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do, to do whatever you want. Also in Galatians chapter 5, 25, it says, since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. So we are coming up to the summation Already? of Bible study. We just got started. Yeah, I know. If the Christian's principles taught in this lesson are a reality in the lives of those who say, they are true believers. They can be assured, I'm sorry, that say that they are Christians, right. they can be assured that they are true believers. In addition to their blessings of insurance that we get, they can be confident that they are lights shining in a world that is full of darkness. Amen. Amen. Uh, in closing, uh, my little small remark, and listening to what you said, uh, and I read it earlier, is that um, I, I, I use, you know, I speak in analogies. You know, I, I look at all the different car models and car makes that are yes. out there. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, four doors and there's two doors, there's SUVs. But when it comes to certain car models, like maybe a Rolls Royce uh, or a Bentley, those stand out mm -hmm. and they don't need to advertise on TV because those stand out. They, they, they are of a unique quality. When you're driving, you know, when you see one coming down the street, I don't care if you had a stoplight or if you're going through the intersection, you always kind of turn and give that two second look like, oh, that's a, that's a Bentley, that's a Rolls mm -hmm. Royce. That's the type of light that we need to be to the world. We need to be God's Rolls Royces and God's Bentleys to be and to live a, that quality life. When people see those cars, they know that they're getting a high quality car. Mm -hmm. they, know, they know there's something special about that car. There's something different about that car. That's the way the world should look at us. Amen. Well, I agree with everything that has been said tonight. Mm -hmm. And I am confident that the good work that God has started in us as believers. And you. And he will complete it. Yes. So keep following the spirit of God and be well. Until next time, be blessed. Emmanuel Community Church is located at 12607 Crenshaw Boulevard in the city of Hawthorne, California. You can find all of our messages on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click subscribe. And thanks for watching. Be blessed for God is with us.